podcast where hopefully you're encouraged because the good news is true and good. Walking through the Bible five minutes at a time and looking at the book of Job. And if you're enjoying the narratives of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther, uh, terrific. There's a little bit of narrative in Job, but this is a section of scripture that uh, many scholars call wisdom literature. And wisdom literature seeks to answer very different questions um, than other parts of scripture. C.S. Lewis talks about three kinds of language. Mundane language, which would be the language of Esther, though it's not a mundane story. Scientific language, which would, for the Bible would be theological statements like the book of Romans. And artistic or poetic language, and Job falls into that. Even though there is narrative to it, it is mostly exalted poetry. And the story is wild. Uh, Satan comes to the court of heaven. He and God discuss Job. God gives Satan permission to make Job suffer. This happens more than once. The bulk of the story is then Job's friends coming and sitting with him in ashes after his children die and all of his riches are taken away. And for seven days, they simply sit with him. And then they start to say some of the worst things about God in truth in Scripture, namely that Job has suffered because he sinned. Job knows this is not true, but both accuses God of not showing up and says he needs an advocate. And there's some sense that he knows that advocate is God. There's some sense of his faith and hope in this time, but he's also an incredibly distressed and disoriented man by the losses in his life of his children, of his finances, and of his health. He's covered in sores. Chapters 32 through 37 are the most debated and uh, oddest part of the book, and that's where... A new person comes up, the only person with an Israelite name. Neither Job nor his friends um, are Israelites. Um, And it's debated whether the story is meant to be taken literally or not. I'm not going to get into that in five minutes. And his friend essentially resets the narrative. He criticizes Job and he criticizes Job's friends. Then chapter 38 begins with God responding to Job. God appears in a whirlwind and says to Job, you were not there when I made the world. Meaning, I think, that the plans and the purposes of God will always be partially inexplicable to us. Which leads us to the real question, I think, that Job is dealing with. And I say I think because it's a very hotly debated book for a lot of reasons. But I think the question that it addresses is, can faith withstand suffering? I think that's a beautiful question, and the answer is, incontrovertibly, yes. Now, there are other things that we could look at or think about with respect to Job. And Job will indirectly deal with that on almost every page. We also notice something that all of us have noticed, whether we realize it or not. One of the most profound loving opportunities in our life, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, is to sit with someone in their suffering and not say wrong or stupid or arrogant or obnoxious or accidentally terrible things. And the best way to know that you're not saying wrong or obnoxious or terrible things is to just sit with them. If you choose to ask questions, they better not be leading questions. If they ask you things, Well, now you're really on the spot because you'll need to respond. But profound, profound opportunity for us as human beings, and especially as Christians, is to simply sit with people in their grief and in their pain. And no matter how it makes us feel, continue to sit with them. Not forever, but for a while. So all the questions that Job makes us think of can distract us from the question that Job answers. Can faith withstand suffering? Can faith actually be that steadfast that we could lose everything and continue to believe and trust in God? And the answer, at least from Job, is incontrovertibly yes. Yes.